Welcome, welcome to the Headless Dam with Cloudinary Bootcamp course lesson number nine, an overview of image compression today presented by Young Snares. Now he's back because he presented another great lesson as well. He's the senior image researcher at Cloudinary. If you do want to learn more about him, check out his last lesson, but also you can check out a great interview I did with him in the introduction section of this course on headlesscreator.com. So without further ado, Jan, welcome to the presentation. Glad to have you back. Glad to be here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you get started. And for those watching live, remember, put in questions in the chat and I'll ask Jan. Jan, it's all yours, sir. Thank you. So previously, I've already discussed um, image formats at a high level. Um, in this course, we'll dig in a bit into the details of compression itself. So first of all, why do we need compression? So images, sometimes people say images are worth a thousand words. Actually, if you do the math, it's more like a million words. One pixel typically uncompressed means three bytes. So one megapixel means three megabytes. Um, so if you look at the amount of data that uncompressed images use, it's quite a lot compared to text. And compression is, is very much needed to reduce the size of, of images. So there's two ways, I already discussed this in the previous lesson, two ways to do compression. One is lossless, where all the information gets preserved. The other is lossy, where you do throw away some of the information in the image, uh, hopefully in a way that you don't really notice. Uh, and those two methods have very different uh, amounts of compression that they can achieve. Typically for lossless, you can reduce the size by a factor of two or three. With lossy, you can easily get uh, 10 or even 20 uh, times uh, smaller files than uncompressed. But of course, information that is thrown away is gone and cannot be recovered. So in the lesson on image formats, I made this kind of diagram that uh, positions the different formats in terms of their place in the workflow, going from altering to delivery. Um, and in terms of compression, each uh, part of the workflow also has different demands. So when you're doing altering, what you typically want to do is use lossless compression. Um, the focus also will be to have fast encoding because you don't want to wait a few minutes every time you, you press the save button in, in your image editor. Um, whereas for web delivery, the focus is not so much on encode speed, but on decode speed. You want the images to show up quickly. Um, and the focus is not so much on high precision or lossless compression. The focus is on reducing the size of the files so that they don't use too much bandwidth. Uh, so it's almost always lossy compression on the web. So depending on the use case, depending on the place in the workflow, different types of compression are needed for altering typically lossless, for delivery typically, typically lossy. Um, and a lot of formats can do both, but you will use them in different ways depending on where in the workflow you are. So in this lesson, first part will be about lossless compression. Second part will be about lossy compression. And those two types of compression are quite different. So let's start with the lossless compression. So in lossless compression, all the pixel values are preserved exactly. And this is very useful when you're still editing the image. There are many formats that can do lossless image compression. I've listed a few here. Um, and they each have different features. Um, so the one of the important things to look for is the bit depth. Uh, so the maximum precision that you can have per pixel. Um, if you have only eight bit available, this is probably not good enough for some of the uh, uh, editing jobs because you need to have more precision available to be able to adjust colors, apply effects and things like that while editing without um, uh, getting artifacts introduced due to the low precision. Um, so um, 
uh, another thing that you can find in some of the uh, lossless image formats is the support for multiple layers. Um, so often in image editors, you can um, edit the image in, in, in different layers and preserve those layers when saving uh, the image. Um, many formats don't support that, like PNG or, uh, or Repi. Uh, force you to to flatten the image to to uh, a single layer, but some of the formats do support um, preserving the layers. Then there's uh, CMYK, um, which is useful for print. It's not that useful for um, for web use cases. Um, so yeah, different formats have different features, um, and of course, um, this is one thing to look at. But the other thing to look at is um, the trade-off between how small the files can get and how long it takes to save them. Um, so in, in general, if you are willing to wait longer, um, you can optimize losslessly images uh, further. Like if you use the PNG format, there are different ways to do PNG encoding, and you can have ways that are faster, but the files will not be that far away from uh, from uncompressed. Or you can spend more effort, more encode effort, and get smaller files, but it will take longer to encode them. Um, so for most formats, you have different encoder settings. Um, in, in a lot of software, you don't really get to choose and you have to pick a specific uh, trade-off. But uh, in terms of what the formats can do, you can have this kind of trade-off. Um, so formats like TIFF and Photoshop are essentially almost uncompressed. They do a little compression, but not much. So the files will still be quite close to the uncompressed size. Whereas more recent formats like WebP and JPEGXL can do lossless compression and get significant uh, reductions in the in the file sizes. Um, so in lossless compression, this is basically the main trade-off. Um, the pixel values are in the end the same, so there is no quality to be um, uh, discussed here. Um, so the only thing that matters is how small can it get and how long does it take to to get there. Now, uh, I discussed lossless mostly in the context of authoring, but it can also be useful for delivery, for web delivery, for specific types of images. Um, so especially pixel art and screenshots, or things like plots and diagrams, um, or in general, images with very few colors, they tend to um, benefit from lossless compression in the sense that, paradoxically, the lossless image can actually be smaller than the lossy image. So in, if that happens, there is no real reason to use lossy compression at all. Um, all right, so how does lossless compression actually work? Let's dig into some of the technical details here. So I've listed below some of the formats that use this technique, and I try to um, summarize in, in, in the blue text uh, by means of example what it really means. So Huffman coding is something that uh, a lot of formats use. And the idea there is basically to use a variable number of bits per pixel. So instead of if the pixel values are 8 bit, you could use just 8 bits per pixel all the time. But it's better for compression to not do that and to basically look at what values are more common. For instance, uh, if you have an image with a white background, white might be more common. So that specific number, you could use only a few bits to represent that number. And numbers that are less common, you use more than eight bits. But overall, the total number of bits to represent um, the image can be a lot smaller this way. So that's Huffman coding. There is a variant of that which can even use less than one bit per uh, value that gets encoded. Um, 
there's several variants actually that can do that. ANS is one of them and arithmetic coding is another. Another technique that is very commonly used in lossless compression is run length encoding. So if you have a number of pixels in a row that have the same value, instead of encoding that value that many times, you can basically in the image format say the next n pixels are all this color. Um, and if the number of pixels that is the same color is large enough, then this will be a more concise way of representing it. Of course, this is not done in text, but in a binary representation that represents this kind of thing. Um, a more advanced version of run length encoding is um, called LZ77 encoding, where you don't only have the same value that gets repeated, but you can basically copy elements from another part in the image that is already um, decoded and um, have kind of instructions saying for the next this many pixels, go back that many pixels and copy from there. Um, so if you have like a screenshot that has text in it, uh, the text consisting of letters and those letters, the same letter will appear in many places, then this type of encoding can be very effective because you only need to encode a letter shape once and then the next time you can basically say, copy it from this other place in the image, which will be um, a more compact way of, of describing it. Another thing is prediction. Um, so you can, uh, instead of encoding the pixel values themselves, you can try to predict them based on the neighboring pixels. And instead of en encoding the pixel value, you encode the difference with the prediction. The goal being that the difference is often zero or close to zero, which means that the entropy coding, the Huffman coding or the ANS coding will become more effective because you will have symbols that or values that have um, um, that occur very often, which means very little bits can, can be used for those. And in the end, the, the total size will go down. Um, another trick is color transforms. So instead of encoding the image as RGB, uh, red, green, and blue, you can apply some transformation to that. For instance, subtracting the green from the red and the blue values, which means that if the image would be grayscale, for instance, then only the green value needs to be encoded and the other two would become zeros. So this is another way to get more zeros or more small numbers, making the entropy coding more effective. And then finally, uh, another technique uh, more advanced is to do context modeling where the kind of entropy coding that is used, the distribution of, of symbols is depending on the context, depending on the neighboring pixels and their properties. Um, so you can, for instance, uh, use a different type of entropy coding in regions of the image that are busy compared to regions that are smooth. So those are some of the techniques for, lossy comp uh, for lossless compression, sorry. Um, there's more than just this, but um, yeah, this gives you an idea of the kind of things that is done. Um, let's move on to lossy compression. So lossy compression is a quite different thing where it's more about throwing some things away. So the most common technique in, in lossy compression um, in basically all lossy image formats, even all lossy, all, all video codecs uh, and so on is also like all kinds of signal processing is the DCT, the discrete cosine transform. So the idea here is to convert pixels into frequency coefficients. Um, so the way this is done in JPEG is to work with eight by eight blocks of pixels. So eight by eight pixels, that's 64 pixels. Mathematically, those 64 numbers can also be represented as a sum of these 64 basic patterns. Um, uh, and by doing it this way, 
instead of representing the the little block of eight by eight pixels with 64 sample values pixel values you represent it with 64 coefficients uh, some of them are very low frequency coefficients corresponding to the basically zoomed out version of, of that block while uh, many of them are high frequency coefficients corresponding to the, the finer detail and now this in itself is just a mathematical transformation that is reversible but to make it lossy what is done is have is basically having different amounts of precision for different coefficients and Typically, the low frequency coefficients will be the ones that get higher precision, and the high frequency ones will be the ones that get lower precision. Um, because basically, the low frequency ones are visually more important. Um, so, this is this process is called quantization. It's it's a way to reduce the, the precision um, of the coefficients, and the, the more aggressive you do this quantization, so the, the the more you reduce the precision, the more compression you will get, also the more artifacts you will get. Um, but this is the way to, to apply loss uh, in a way that is uh, visually um, nice to have. So this is basically how JPEG works. Uh, there's one more thing. This is for grayscale. Um, so if you do this for color images, one other trick that JPEG uses is instead of using RGB representations, uh, it uses a representation where you separate um, uh, the signal into a grayscale version of the image that, that is called Luma, and then two color components uh, that are called Chroma. Um, and the idea is that luma is more important than chroma basically so you can apply more aggressive quantization to the chroma part of the image in in an extreme case you can even just throw away all the high frequency coefficients and pretend that they're zeros that's called chroma subsampling um, but in general you can just apply more aggressive quantization to the chroma than to the luma and this is a way to preserve basically the uh, the grayscale version of the image better than the color information, which corresponds to how the human uh, visual system also works. So doing this kind of lossy compression can lead to visual artifacts, uh, especially if you try to push down the file sizes too much. So one thing that can happen is called color banding. Um, it typically happens in large smooth areas like skies where um, of course the example i'm giving is a bit extreme but um, where you basically start seeing these bands of color instead of a smooth gradient this is normally caused caused by the um, the low frequency coefficients or even the dc coefficient the, the most low frequency coefficient um, to be uh, quantize too much basically uh, so that there's not enough precision to, to represent um, the smooth gradient nicely. If you have too much quantization in the higher frequency, the effect that you will get is ringing, uh, also called rippling or ghost or echoes. And it typically happens around strong edges, like thin edges. Um, where you get these kind of, uh, I don't know if it will be visible on the, um, on, the, on this video, because there's of course additional artifacts introduced by the video compression, but you get some, um, um, some kind of um, uh, artifacts around those edges, especially around text, this is uh, very noticeable. Uh, it's also sometimes called mosquito noise, um, so you get these little speckles around the strong edges in the image. Another kind of artifact that is very common is blurring or smoothing too much. So basically the high frequency signal, the, 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 the subtle textures in the image get destroyed by, the, by quantizing them too much. And 
what you're left with is a, is a smoothed out um, version of the image. Um, excessive smoothing is especially common in uh, the more modern formats. Uh, in the older formats like JPEG, what you typically get is a blockiness effect where you can see the 8x8 blocks in the image. Um, and um, yeah, this is, also, of course, also not very nice to look at. So you can get these compression artifacts by doing lossy compression, um, reducing the file size too much. But another way you can get problematic artifacts is by the process of generation loss, which is what happens if you load an image, uh, save it lossily, and then load it again and save it again lossily. Uh, and if you do this enough times, then the compression artifacts will start to accumulate. This is what happens with memes on the internet quite often as they get shared a lot and, and um, as they go viral they move between different platforms like Facebook and Twitter and so on. Uh, each of the platforms applies their own uh, recompression in a lossy way of the image and the artifacts accumulate. So this is uh, basically the main reason why you want to avoid lossy compression during authoring um, because if you keep on saving images in a lossy way, editing them a little and then saving again, uh, in the end, the, the artifacts will uh, get worse and worse. So some details on some of the newer formats like AVIF and JPEGXL. So one thing they do in addition to what JPEG does is having variable block sizes. So JPEG always uses eight by eight blocks, but in AVIF or JPEGXL, you can have blocks that have different dimensions. Uh, here, here is an example of the ones that are available in JPEGXL. So you can have rectangular blocks, uh, you can have larger blocks, smaller blocks. Um, and this allows the image format to actually uh, match the, the, the shapes in the image better um, and to use, for instance, large blocks when not much is happening in that part of the image and smaller blocks when uh, when more precision is, is needed. Um, so that's one thing. The other is to do the quantization in, a, in an adaptive way. So in the old JPEG format, you use the same amount of quantization for the, for the entire image. Um, in newer formats, you can adjust the quantization uh, for each region in the image, which can also help to avoid artifacts um, in, in uh, places where they would be too problematic while uh, having a, a lower quality where it's actually good enough. Um, and then another thing that the new formats all do is filtering, um, not in, in, the, in the sense of, of prediction uh, in, in, in lossless coding, but uh, filtering in the sense of um, basically blurring the the image so that the, the blockiness uh, disappears. Uh, but this blurring is done in a, in a way that can be locally adjusted. Uh, so you can avoid smoothing too much. And it's also uh, typically done in a way that avoids sm uh, blurring edges too much. So uh, if there is a strong edge, it will remain. If there's just a little ringing, it will um, it will get removed by the deep blocking filter. At least that's the goal. Um, all right. So, what are the trade offs in lossy compression? Um, so, of course, in lossless, quality is not an issue because it's just uh, preserving everything. In lossy, quality is a thing. And there is a, a bit of confusion about what quality means because it's often expressed as a number but this number by itself is is not really meaningful um, it depends on the software if you go into photoshop and you select quality 80 it has a different meaning than if you go into some other software and select quality 80 there um, so this is basically just a way to to um, uh, configure uh, a lossy encoder in, in general, encoders have a lot of settings that you can adjust, but that wouldn't be very user-friendly. So 
to make it simpler, they typically have just one uh, slider that you can set to, uh, and then they call this slider quality. But it will be different for different encoders. It will definitely be different for different codecs. So it's not a universal thing. Um, so if you want to measure the actual visual quality uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that can be compared across different encoders and different formats, you need to do subjective experiments. Uh, so collect opinion scores of, of actual humans that are looking at images. Or you can use perceptual metrics um, that are designed to try to estimate the uh, visual quality of an image. Um, and, and this is a way to, um, to estimate the, the actual quality. Um, so the, real quick on that, um, yeah. that's interesting because, uh, at the end of the day, in practical ways, right? It, it, on the quality, it becomes of not only just how does it look, but how does it look in a particular device? So it, it let's just take like a quality 80 may look great on a small device, but when you bring it up to a big browser, visually, you can see more of the pixelation or whatever it did to the quality. So would you recommend that when they are playing around with the quality setting, which of course underneath it does a lot of other things, that they check it out in different uh, devices to see if that quality really meets the needs of the delivery that you're going for? Yeah, absolutely. The kind of fidelity that you need in an image depends a lot on the use case and it depends on what the viewing conditions will ultimately be. So if, if you have like, for instance, an, an application that is only targeting phones, then you know that the physical size of the screen is going to be something if it's designed for for outdoor, outdoors activities for instance on phones then you know that the lighting conditions will probably um uh, if, 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 if there's sunlight and so on it, it's a different thing than um if, if you're going to watch it on a big screen in in, uh, in a dark room and so on uh so definitely you have to take the viewing conditions into account um, and the fidelity that is needed because it depends a lot on what the image is used for. If it's like uh, an e-commerce website where you're trying to sell a piece of uh, uh, clothing, then you probably want people to have a very good idea of what that will actually look like. So the fidelity needs to be quite high. Whereas if the image is just an illustration to um, to, to make uh, some, uh, like just a stock fo photo of something to, to, to liven up some, some uh, boring text. Um, it's probably not very important that the fidelity is high because the image is just there to, as a decoration basically. So it, it depends on the, um, on the fidelity needs. Uh, and it depends on the viewing conditions. Yeah, I think you made some excellent points there. And it's because at the end of the day, that quality lever really means nothing until you see the output and like you mentioned in all those conditions and the purpose of what they what they want to do with right um yeah. so great great points thank you Jan. so in in general in, in lossy compression the trade-off is always between trying to reduce the, the file sizes uh, but also trying to have the, the highest possible fidelity or quality. Um, so for, for every encoder, you can make these kind of curves where um, if you go to the right, the file sizes become larger, but the quality also gets better. If you go to the left, you can compress better, but the quality will suffer. Um, and for instance, if you look at JPEG, there's different JPEG encoders. One is the the, the reference libjpeg uh, that is used in a lot of software. And the other is a more recent one that was made by uh, Mozilla, it's called MozJPEG. Um, and you can see that these different encoders have a different um, uh, have different results, have different performance. The MozJPEG one is producing a higher quality for, this, for the same uh, file size, even though both are using, uh, are, are um, encoding JPEGs. So there is, some uh, flexibility in formats that allows encoders to do different things. Uh, and if you, if, if you have a better encoder, it, it can uh, get better compression performance. Um, 
of course, in general, the the newer formats are are compressing better, as as you would expect. Um, so, for instance, AVIF does uh, does give better compression than uh, than JPEG. Uh, JPEG XL, one of the most recent formats, does give better compression than AVIF, and so on. Um, another thing to take into account is the speed of encoding. Um, so different encoders have different speeds, and many of the more recent encoders have actually a setting to, to select how fast they are. Um, and the difference can be like uh, the, at, the, at the slowest setting, it, it might take even a few minutes to encode a single image, uh, whereas uh, at the fastest setting, it might be a fraction of a second. Um, so it depends on, on your use case, whether you can afford to wait uh, that long. Um, but you do get different results if you allow the encoder to be slower, then it will get a better curve in, ter in terms of um, uh, quality for, for a given um, file size. So this is another type of trade-off that, uh, that you have to make. All right, so to conclude, what uh, format to use when doing lossy compression? So there's, I think, two important aspects. One is, of course, the compression performance itself. Uh, if you look at that, it's basically the more recent the format is, the better the, the performance will be. So uh, the, the best uh, compression you get currently with JPXL, uh, next best would be AVIF uh, and HEEC. Then uh, an older generation would be WebP, an even older one would be JPEG 2000 all the way to JPEG itself, which um, is now 30 years old. Um, and well, it's uh, being the oldest, also the worst, uh, though it's still quite good, actually. Um, so the other thing besides compression performance itself is interoperability and software support. So the, the one thing that JPEG has is that it's supported by basically everything. So you can always uh, rely on it being uh, supported. Um, so that's uh, sometimes um, the the only thing that you need to consider because if it's not going to work, then uh, then it's not going to work. Um, but also, for instance, WebP uh, on the web now has support in all of the major browsers. AVIF is also getting close to that, so that's uh, that means that they can be used. Uh, JPXL at at this moment on the web cannot be used, unfortunately. So in general, uh, in web applications, the best practice is to use actually multiple formats um, and uh, use the best one that is available that can be used uh, in the browser that, uh, that is accessing the website. So one way to do that is the F-Auto uh, option in Cloudinary, which um, automatically will deliver the image in the format, the best available format for the client. Another way is to use the HTML picture tag with multiple sources. So you can, for instance, have an AVIF image uh, with a WebP fallback and a JPEG fallback to the fallback. Um, so um, that is a way to get the benefits of the newer formats without um, having the problem of interoperability. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you for... Uh, um, listening all the way until here and uh, yeah thank you Jan that was an amazing presentation thank you so much um, so some really important uh, concepts here but I think at the end of the day the takeaway is if you are going to implement any kind of uh, uh, digital asset management system the ability to have one source image have it be able to automatically generate different formats and have it be able to detect where it's being delivered, what's the best format for that delivery would be a great feature to have, regardless if it's Cloudinary or any other, right? Uh, digital asset management system have that. That's a great feature to have, as opposed to having, like you mentioned last, the the picture tag where you have to hard code all, in other words, you're creating all these multiple versions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah of course, the, the picture tag is, it's um, a very manual way of doing it. and. Uh, doesn't really scale that well if you also want to have responsive images you know where the the, the dimensions of the image are um, flexible right. um, so um, it 
gets quite complicated quite easily uh, if, if you need to combine those. Um, right. But it is an option um, uh, that is available. Yeah, definitely. Very cool. So if people want to get hold of you, that would be the email right there? Yep, yep, indeed. Jan, it was a pleasure. Thank you for doing another lesson on the boot camp. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to the rest of you for watching. I hope you really enjoyed it. And remember to keep on watching and uh, continue your journey learning all about digital asset management systems by watching the next lesson, which is coming up very soon. Also, if you want to get your knowledge certification, make sure you use the study guide for this lesson, which you can find in the bonus section of this course on headlesscreator.com. And as always, get a hold of me right there, Marcelo at headlesscreator.com. So until the next lesson, have a great one, everybody.